morning, everybody. Uh, it's, it's great, and thank you for the organizers for giving me this chance to uh, start the session and share some of our insights on, on sort of how we design and screen antisense oligonucleotide therapeutics. Um, so to start with, I'll just walk through um, what, whoop, I'll stay around here, uh, what, are, what, what my goals are here. Really, I wanna, wanna be able to sort of provide a basis for understanding the sort of basic biology of how ASOs work and sort of how that informs us in terms of how we wanna design and screen oligonucleotides. Um, and then we'll share some of our observations in terms of things that we've learned in, in the, the exercises that we've gone through at IONIS. Um, so we'll, we'll cover sort of the mechanisms of sort of ASOs getting into the cells, how they work, and then uh, we'll work through uh, target selection and, and screening process. Uh, and then hopefully we'll get into some future perspectives. Um, so so I'll, I'll start here because it's a good place to go and I have to apologize, I have no pointer, so I'll gesticulate and move away from the mics occasionally. But uh, effectively, oligonucleotides are, you know, ASOs are, are, are pretty phenomenal. They get into the cells uh, and they sort of, uh, as a single-stranded molecule, they're, hot, you know, they're charged, they stick to things like proteins, and they get readily absorbed into the cell through endocytosis. Uh, and once they're into the cell, they sort of distribute broadly and they, get a, get, they, they end up both in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, in which case they engage with their, their target RNA molecules in which they form watson crick base paired uh, duplexes. Uh, once they do that, they can sort of, uh, you know, basically modulate a variety of different biological processes. We've shown that we can sort of interfere with, with sort of polyadenylation of five prime cap uh, um, uh, formation, um, and, and obviously splicing can be modulated as well. Um, but, but what I'm gonna focus on today, since, we're, since the topic of the session is on knockdown, I'm gonna focus on what uh, ASOs are probably most famous for, which is RNSH dependent uh, uh, degradation of uh, RNAs or transcripts. And this can happen, as I highlight here, both in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, uh, and effectively uh, what happens is uh, you form a RNA-DNA-like duplex, RNASH comes, and it catalyzes cleavage of the transcripts. Um, so I'll start by, by sort of focusing on what an ASO is. Uh, uh, most in the audience probably recognize this, but I'll just uh, mention that uh, effectively, the, the exercise in, in bringing ASOs forward is really about taking DNA and making it a reasonably good drug-like molecule. So the, the sort of basic form is this Gapmer design, and the Gapmer design has uh, effectively sugar modifications on the, on the ends, both the five prime and three prime ends that provide stability in the cell and enhances uh, affinity um, and tolerability of the compounds, and then re it, release, it, it leaves the DNA gap there, which is what RNAs chooses to recognize the, the duplex. This makes the, the ASO sort of suitable for simple formulation. We can get away with subcutaneous dosing. They're, they're as I said, single-stranded, so they sort of stick to stuff and move around. They stick to proteins. Um, we'll learn more about that later today. Um, and they, they shouldn't interact with other drugs because they're not like small molecules. Um, and we've, we've, we've used these in, in a broad, broad perspective. We have a lot of clinical experience now. Uh, around 7,000 or more patients have been uh, dosed with oligos and across the hundreds of clinical trials. Um, and and they're, they're, they're pretty attractive from a tolerability, tolerability perspective. And what's, what's great about the platform in general, of course, is that what you learn about one compound is, is transferable to many other compounds. So this gives us a lot of sort of uh, priors when, when thinking about going into the clinic with new, new drugs. Um, just from a mechanism point of view, I'll, I'll sort of walk through a little bit of this. And, and what, I've, what I've shown here is some of the structural analysis done, and there's some references up here that are probably worthy of, 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 of digging in deeper on, but from a, from a superficial point of view, effectively what happens is RNAs H1 is a, it sort of is a, it's got two subcomponents, one of which is a, it's a, it's a DNA, uh, a binding domain and then a cleavage domain, the enzymatic domain. Uh, the, the, the binding domain dies and then, and then uh, it wraps around and it cleaves uh, basically on the other side of the duplex, uh, four bases down, um, and it, it sort of it sort of works in this capacity. And, and knowing this allows you to understand a little bit about where the gap needs to be and sort of how the, how the enzyme is going to engage with the RNA-DNA duplex. Um, and, 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 and moving forward, you can think, well, what, what sort of modifications can we put into the DNA or the, the oligo to do a variety of things? And people have done a, a variety of, of, of SARs to sort of explore the different chemical properties that you can instill in these, these compounds. And, and some of them have improved things and some have made them worse. Uh, and I, I walked through uh, some of the common ones here. And you can see, uh, if, you, if you look over here on the, on the left, these are, these are things that sort of have, have been not, not helpful. Uh, so 
uh, for, for, for delivery purposes, for instance, if you make the, the molecule less uh, charged, so you put a PNA in or a morvolino, it, it, it sort of makes the PKPD distribution of the compounds much more challenging to get into cells. Um, and then if you, if you, if you look at the, the, on the top, the phosphothioate backbones, those, those are probably the most useful thing that, that people have discovered. And, and one, of the, one of the great things that, that stabilizes and keeps the compounds uh, in, the, in the system longer. And then the affinity, the sugar modifications on the right, the, starting the upper right-hand corner with the CFBNA, which is, uh, that, that increases uh, uh, basically affinity by, by pre-stacking the, the, the sugars. And then, and then LNAs do a similar thing, and then you have the MOs uh, and the 2 primo methyls as well as these different sugar modifications that sort of have enhanced affinity of the compounds, uh, and which, which increases, uh, you know, basically the the, the capacity of the compound to, to do what we wanted to do. Um, so uh, moving forward, so if you, if you think about this, then there's, there's a lot of challenges associated with finding good oligos. Oh, a pointer. Beautiful. All right, that helps. Um, so, so one of the challenges, uh, of course, with, with finding uh, oligonucleotide therapeutics is that that, you know, there's, as I said, we, we get activity both uh, uh, anywhere in the transcript, so that means if you've looked at a transcript, they're big, so there's, there's lots, of, lots of potential transcripts to choose from, uh, which also uh, raises a little bit of a concern about potential off-target effects, because now you have a lot of places to avoid as well. Um, and, then, and, then, and then our oligos are, are, are short, and, and we need to uh, avoid sort of uh, immune responses as well. So, so just, uh, just some data now, uh, if, you, if, you, if you ask the question about, if you, if you just look at all uh, ASOs in general and you say, I'm just going to take a whole bunch of oligos, I'm going to put them in the cell and ask, what's the likelihood of them being active? Uh, it turns out uh, uh, not, not that great. So this is a distribution plot. So you can, this, this is a histogram of, of percent, percent control. So good oligos are over here on the, on, on the left with 0% control. These are 100% control. Most, most ASOs are actually uh, not that active. Um, uh, our good compounds we find, it, and this is in vitro screening data, um, uh, our good compounds are usually less than 15% control, and you can see that they're, they're challenging to find. Um, and I, I should mention, uh, I've transitioned, I'm going to talk mostly in, the, in this data about our, our Gen 2.5 CET experience, which is, I think, transferable to other, other, com uh, other chemistries as well. Oh, now I've got two things. Um, so the other, the, the, so, so then, you might want to try to learn a little bit better than just going randomly into the transcript. Where, where would you like to design your oligos? Um, you know, one, one, one option would be maybe transcript position is, a, is an indicator of activity. It turns out, turns out this is a, this is a, a graph that demonstrates uh, a percent control now, uh, knocked down on the, on, the, on the left axis, on the, on the y axis here, and then on the x axis we have position. This is fractional position normalized to the transcript length. And, and what, what I think you should walk away from this distribution, it's a density plot, is that there's not a whole lot of, of uh, impact, right? You can find very active oligos at the, at, the five, at the five prime end or the three prime end of the transcript. Um, so you might ask about exon, intron, or, or UTR bias associated with uh, activity of the oligos. And, and, and here I have a, a distribution of uh, three distributions overlaid on top of each other. And, and hopefully you can see that uh, from here you can see that uh, there might be a slight bias for activity in the in the green the green chart here, which is exonic, uh, but it, it, especially at the the left hand where we really care about this is percent control by the way now as a fraction. But um, you can see that it, it really doesn't it doesn't give you a whole lot of leverage. And and what's more vexing perhaps is that uh, if you look about individual targets, uh, you know each target sort of has a different story to tell in terms of whether or not the introns or exons will be better. So so some 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 targets introns are better. And that you can see with this red line here. Some targets, exons are better. This is the green line here. And some, some targets, it, it turns out, didn't make a difference at all. So this, is, this just, just makes you think you, you're really going to be stuck having to screen a little bit. Um, one, of, one of the things, I'll, I'll come back to sort of how we can enhance that a little bit in the future. But one thing that we, we have definitively shown is that you can enhance activity by looking for these like sort of gene or transcript specific repeats. So this is, this is work that came from, from Tim Vickers and out, of a, out of the Crook Lab at Ionis. And, and what, what, they, what they showed very convincingly is that if you take and you, you look up here, uh, if you take a, a transcript and you engineer it to have either, either one site, two sites, or four sites, you can increase the activity of that transcript or that knockdown uh, pretty readily. And, and then if you look at the endogenously repeated sites that are just naturally occurring in the transcriptome, 
which, which occur more frequently than you might expect, you also see an in, uh, uh, a slight increase, or, or it can actually be pretty pronounced for some transcripts, uh, where, where, where sites that have repeats in them, or repeated sites in the transcript, I should say, are, are more likely to be active. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about off-targets and, and sort of how we deal with that. Um, and effectively, the best way to deal with the, the sort of off-target effects are, are just to avoid designing oligos that uh, match other places in the transcripts. But, but what I want to show is that you can, you can do pretty good but in silico, sort of if you just look for perfect matches elsewhere and you, you ask then how well do you get knocked down of, of non-perfect match complexes, it turns out if you avoid them and then you, you can assess and this is an example of where we, we sort of look at on-target activity and then we look at all the possible mismatched uh, sites in the transcript dome and we look at their knockdown relative to the on-target. You can see that there's, a, there's quite a bit of difference between the, the knockdown we see, often no knockdown, versus uh, the on-target knockdown. So uh, when dealing with off-targets, you just want to avoid designing to places where you'd have multiple hits in the transcriptome as a, as a matter of uh, effect. And as long as you're, if your oligo is a, a well-tolerated oligo, they, they are highly selective in that, in that capacity. Um, and this is work from, from Sebastian Burrell and, and myself. And, and here what Sebastian, what Sebastian was, uh, what shows is that uh, uh, although, although well-tolerated oligos are highly selective, uh, you, you can find, uh, and there do, does exist, a, a collection of toxic oligos that tend to be, you know, less, less highly selective. And this, this work's been published, and, and effectively what you can see here is that if you look at well-tolerated oligos over here, uh, they, there's not much of a transcriptional signature that happens in terms of, of where, where you have off-target effects. Um, and then if you look here at the toxic, uh, hepatotoxic compounds, what we, what we tend to see is that you start to see a, a lot more off-target uh, interactions and downregulation of many genes, and they tend to be sort of not, not commonly, and they're not, not associated with a particular pathway or, or otherwise. Um, so, so with that in mind, how do we, how do we go about uh, uh, finding, finding good oligos then? I'll just walk through our typical screening paradigm. And, and, and so what we, what we end up doing is we, we do in silico design, and, and in silico design is cheap and, and fairly easy, so we just design in silico all possible compounds that you might want to go to a, a transcript. Uh, and we evaluate them for, our, for their potential off-target matches, uh, and then we choose uh, which ones we want to push forward into an in vitro screen. In the in vitro screen, we, we screen somewhere between 100 and 1,000 compounds, depending on how hard we have to or how, how interested we are to target. And then, and then we, we sort of then want to make sure that anything we see in a single dose screen is dose responsive. Uh, so we then do a dose response screen, and then we usually do an in vivo screen on top of that. Uh, and then once we get down to this point, we're, we're down to a handful of car compounds, and, and, that go, and, and then we're ready to go forward. The, the critical things that I think you, you, you want to keep in mind when, when screening oligos is that um, uh, we, we want to make sure that multiple oligos targeting the same transcript affect the same biological effect. This is just a, a nice way of controlling your experiments. Um, and uh, and, and we, we, we design oligos across the, the entire transcript to ensure that we capture as much possible, possible space in the, in the transcript as possible. Um, so moving forward, I think it's, it's, it's good to sort of see where the, the, the platform is moving and where, where things are, are pushing forward. And, and you know, really, if you think about where we want to see oligonucleotide therapeutics push forward, it's really, it's really the notion of, of sort of thinking about you know, rational drug design done right, which is it's rational on a systems level rather than on, on a drug level, right? We already know how we're going to interact with the, the target. We just want to make sure we're targeting the right thing. But so what we really need is we need to be able to better understand sort of how, how oligos are safe and active and where they're safe and active um, rather than just doing raw screening. We should understand the biology there and build tools that, that sort of leverage that a little bit better. And then we want to be able to, to sort of improve tissue exposure and delivery so to target specific tissues or enhancing cellular uptake. Um, so these are all, all things that can be pushed forward in the, the technology. I'll, I'll, I'll spend a, a little bit of time talking about sort of where we are and others have, have done similar work to this, uh, pushing forward on silico design tools. So what, I, what I'll show here is that, although I, I, I said earlier in the talk that it's really hard to find safe and active compounds and you have to screen a lot, uh, where, where, where we're making steady progress, I think, is, is in terms of in silico design tools. And what I'll, what I'll show in, on the left plot here is a, a density plot of, of toxicity, or hepatotoxicity, I should say, of, 
uh, and measured by ALT versus uh, sort of a, a model prediction of, of the probability of a compound being safe. And, and what you can see is this model is built a, around our, our, our database of, of, of oligos, and, and we've, we've been able to train a model that does a fairly good job of predicting which oligos would be safe or well tolerated versus which models have, uh, which oligos have a very poor chance of being safe and active on, in addition to sort of looking for off-target uh, basis. And then, and then over, over on this side, uh, thinking about activity, activity is a, a little bit more challenging. You can see it's not quite as well separating yet, but what you can see is that the, the model of predicting activity, so probability of being active uh, versus the op observation of percent control on an in vitro screen, we're, we're sort of making s strong, strong headway into sort of being able to sort of bias our screens heavily to, to, to compounds that are, are likely to be safe and active. Um, I expect these algorithms will, will continue to improve and sort of make the platform uh, even, even, even stronger. Um, oh, wrong button. Uh, and then, and then last, I'll just, I'll just mention that you know, once you, once you have this oligo, the other, the other thing you can do is you can sort of put lycas on them or ligating on conjugates that drive the oligos into, into particular places. And for example, uh, we've, we've published on the, the Galnac uh, approach, which, which puts this, this Galnac on a, on a compound, and this works for both ASOs and. SIRNAs and other things, but this, this then, then binds to the galnic receptor, which is fairly expressed on hepatocytes, for instance, and you can see it increases activity uh, up to 30-fold in the, in, in, the, in the clinic here. Um, and that's a, a, you know, this is a, a, a huge, hugely uh, beneficial in terms of lowering our therapeutic dose. Um, so I think coming in almost on time, I'll, I'll walk through my summary here, which is uh, effectively uh, ASOs, ASOs can be identified uh, that sort of knock things down and, and, and I'll just review that they should be, they, they can be active both in nucle the nuclear compartments of the cytosol or, or in, in, in pre-mRNAs and mRNAs. Um, we see activity across introns and exons. Um, and I, I think I've walked through most of this stuff pretty, pretty, pretty readily and I'm already a little bit over time. Um, but, but uh, yeah, so, and, and we're sort of making steady progress in terms of of, of making the, the screening, screening a little bit more efficient using in silico algorithms and, and like it will we'll sort of increase our ability to reach tissues that are difficult to get to. So uh, with that, I will summarize and, and, and thank uh, everybody at IONIS uh, that has contributed to this work.